Chapter 2, Blood and Fire When Jack awoke in the morning, his sister was already sitting up watching the hustle and bustle of the street. Jack rubbed his eyes and turned over to see what drew her attention. They had slept late. The sun had already burned off most of the fog, leaving a bright haze overhead. Jack looked up. There was a hazy circle around the sun. Must mean rain. The street was full of people. A fat woman waddled by, carrying a large basket of laundry. She was so fat that she seemed to have to work very hard just to get where she was going. Hold on to me, skirts, she barked at three apple-faced children coming on behind her, each one a smaller copy of the mother. A man pulled a creaking two-wheeled cart piled high with lumps of cold. I miss Pa, Jack said as tears came to his eyes. He pulled his cap lower. Straight brown hair poked out all around. His hair was the same color as his mother's had been. Amy, however, had her father's hair, red and curly, but not so red as to look orange and not so curly as to be frizzy. For a sister, she could look very pretty, Jack sometimes thought. Today, however, smears of dirt trailed across her forehead and down one cheek. Her hair was tussled, her clothes a mess. Mother would never have let Amy go out looking like that. But now she was gone, and they were alone, so alone. What you looking at, Amy asked. Give me one of those biscuits. Jack dug in his pocket and took out the hunks of stale bread. He handed one to Amy and stuck the other in his teeth as he examined his coat with its missing sleeve. He ought to go search for it. There was a good chance the dog dropped it once it realized it held nothing to eat. You think that dog would have eaten us last night? He asked Amy. I doubt it. Who ever heard of a dog eating a person? It's not like we were sheep and it was a wolf. Dogs go bad and kill sheep sometimes, said Jack. Besides, that one last night looked half wolf. That it did. I've never seen such an ugly thing. I did once hear of dogs eating dead people during a famine. Just then, Jack heard the most peculiar sound. It was the high-pitched sound of a flute and the deep thump, thump, thump of a drum. He stuffed the rest of the biscuit in his mouth and looked down the street. Coming around the corner, about one street away, was a small parade. Each person was in a uniform. Most carried some kind of a band instrument, and one held a brightly colored flag. It was not the familiar British Union Jack. You think they're bobbies? asked Jack, ready to run. Policemen don't march around with a band, said Amy. Otherwise, how would they ever catch any crooks? The troop continued marching up the narrow street beside the cathedral. Small children, chickens, and cats scampered to the side to get out of the way. Then, right at the bottom of the steps, a tall, wiry-haired man with a bushy gray beard and a black top hat shouted a command, and the troop stopped and turned like a machine toward Amy and Jack. They are bobbies, yelled Jack as he grabbed his sister's hand and tried to make a break for it. Hold on there, lad, said the man with the big beard as he easily reached out and caught Jack's arm. Where are you off to so fast? We ain't done nothing, stammered Jack. We just, I mean, sir, we were just looking for our uncle. Jack squirmed to get free. Listen, lad, we're not the police, and we're not after anything more than your soul. But I do want to talk to you. So will you hold still a minute? After my soul, thought Jack. Who could be after my soul other than God or the devil? Jack had only occasionally gone to church, but he wasn't about to let anyone get his soul. On the other hand, you can't just grab a body's soul. Or could you? Jack stood still and the man's iron grip loosened on his arm. The man took off his top hat and stooped down with his hands on his knees until he was on eye level with Jack. The man's nose was large and somewhat hooked. His gray eyes shone like polished steel, deep set under two eyebrows that were not shaped the same. The right one arched high while the left one sloped, giving him a skeptical expression. So, where do you two live? he commanded. His wiry beard jutted out and bobbed with each word carefully pronounced with military precision. We live, began Jack. We live with our Uncle Sedgwick, finished Amy with authority. I see. The man cocked his head and examined Amy. But you don't know where he is, and so you must look for him, is that it? Both children nodded. A likely story indeed, said the man. General, come now, interrupted a woman who stepped forward. Can't you see that these children are scared to death? I'm Catherine Booth, children, beamed the woman with a warm smile. She wore a dark blue bonnet tied under her chin by a broad red ribbon. And this man, who would love to take you captive, 
is none other than my husband, General William Booth of the Salvation Army. It was only then that Jack realized that the troop was made up almost equally by men and women. While the women wore long dresses, their uniform was very military-looking. As for the men, they did look like soldiers on dress parade with sharply cut dark blue uniforms and small brimmed caps with shiny metal crests on the front. The general was dressed slightly differently. Sorry, was dressed the same except for his top hat and slightly different insignia on his uniform. Then Jack noticed that the collar of each person, there was a highly polished brass letter S. While Mrs. Booth talked and the other members of the troop set up the flag and the drum and prepared to play right on the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral, a chill ran through Jack's body as a slight breeze waved the flag. He didn't read too well, but he easily made out the words blood and fire, inscribed above a cross, two cross swords, and again the letter S, blood and fire, blood and fire. What could it mean? Mrs. Booth concluded her introduction by inviting the children to stay and listen to the music. Her face was solemn, but her eyes were smiling. I think we'd better be going, said Amy, as she pulled Jack down the steps and away from this strange army. Jack, she said that the general wants to take us captive, whispered Amy when Jack tried to squirm away. The children spent all that morning walking the streets of East London looking for their uncle. Time and again they would race forward when they saw a sign indicating a tailor's shop, but when they got close to it, it always had someone else's name on it. Once when they were getting a drink of water from a public fountain, Amy said, maybe we ought to be going inside and asking, even though his name's not on the sign. Maybe his shop is in someone else's name. That means we have to go back and check each one we've been to, moaned Jack. But it might speed up our search, said Amy. One tailor ought to know the others. If they are in the same business, someone is bound to know them and can direct us to the right shop. In the third shop they entered, a skinny old man as crooked as a dried-out oak limb glanced up over the top of his spectacles and said, Sedgwick Masters, eh? What you want him for? He's our uncle and we're trying to find him, said Amy. Well, I don't know where he is, said the old man, returning to his sewing, and I don't care to know either. Why not, asked Jack. Because the last time I heard of him was when he stole two of my best customers. The children stared as the man put a handful of pins in his mouth. Finally, Amy said, but you have seen him then? Didn't say I'd seen him, mumbled the tailor as he took one pin after another from his mouth as fast as a dog scratches fleas and stuck them in the garment he was sewing. Actually, I never laid eyes on the man. But you got to know where he is if your customers went to him, persisted Amy. Listen here, young lady, I don't got to know nothing. When one of my customers came back to me, I was grateful. I didn't pry into why he'd left or why he came back. Jack and Amy walked to the door in despair. Then suddenly Jack turned back. Wait, he said. Who were those people, the customers of yours who went to our Uncle Sedgwick? Where are they now? Maybe they know where our uncle is. Like I said, only one came back. He was that dandy Filbert. Wanted me to make him three new suits so he could impress the ladies of Europe. Last I heard, he'd set sail for France. Was going to tour the continent for his cultural enrichment, he said. I haven't seen him since. Who was the other person, said Jack, the one who didn't come back? Well, no, I do know that she's still around, but she's never come back to me, so maybe she's still using masters. Who knows? But who was she? Oh, she's the wife of that general, or so-called general, Booth. Catherine Booth was her name. They're the ones who started that Salvation Army. They march around here all the time. The tailor looked up at Jack and added, Say, boy, you better get your jacket fixed. You're missing a sleeve there.